Hello biology students, this is Mr. Gales and today I'm bringing you biotechnology screencast session number three. This screencast is going to focus on how we derive genetic protection for disease from two topics, gene therapy and genetically engineered vaccines. So our focus again for this screencast is genetic protection from disease. We're going to begin by talking about how we've protected ourselves from disease traditionally. This is a pretty extreme example, and you might be looking at this picture and thinking, what is that exactly? Uh, this is something that's called a plague mask that this individual is wearing. A plague mask became common in Europe during the 13 and 1400s when there were epidemics of bubonic plague that killed large fractions of the population during that time. The idea of the plague mask was that um, that elongated nose piece would be stuffed full of aromatic herbs and it would in some way filter out what it, whatever was causing the disease. Now back in that day, we still hadn't developed germ theory and had really no idea what was causing the plague. So scientists thought that this was would be one way of preventing those evil um, spirits that they would sometimes describe or those evil fumes from getting up into their nose. So something like this, or even today we see people using masks. If you recall a couple years ago, there was this concern over SARS or the bird flu, right, where people would be wearing masks all over the place. Um, so we protect ourselves by separating ourselves as much as possible from disease. We can do this with quarantine units as well. But more and more, we're relying on our technology and our understanding of biotechnology to help protect us from disease. Now, there are two major ways, as I mentioned already. We have gene therapy, and we have genetically engineered vaccines. Gene therapy is still very experimental. It's not quite ready for widespread use yet. Genetically engineered vaccines, on the other hand, have been used for quite a while now. Uh, the big difference between these two is really what they protect us from. Gene therapy repairs disease-causing genes that are already inside of us. These are genes that were, for the most part, genes that we're born with that we aim to repair through this process known as gene therapy. Genetically engineered vaccines, on the other hand, are used to protect against infectious pathogens, which are, uh, for instance, viruses or bacteria, which cause infections in us and can be very dangerous for us. So both of them involve the tools of biotechnology, but what they just approach differently how they're going to protect us from that. Again, gene therapy is protecting uh, us by pre repairing damaged disease genes whereas the vaccine is, is stimulating our immune system to protect us against an external threat. Uh, for gene therapy, let's begin by defining what gene therapy is. This is a technique that can be used to correct a defective gene that would be responsible for a disease. Now, one very great example here of um, a gene therapy that is being used, again, in trials, it's still in experimental trials, but gene therapy that's being used to treat a particular disease relates to cystic fibrosis. You may remember cystic fibrosis from the Cracking the Code video. It is considered to be the number one leading cause of uh, death in, when, when talked about genetically inherited disease in America. So it's uh, fairly common. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutated gene, which is referred to as the CFTR gene. And that gene is responsible for producing a protein that regulates salt and water balance in cells and tissues. The effect of cystic fibrosis is fairly widespread, although most people consider the effect uh, related to the lungs. And so we'll take a look specifically at that here. Within the lungs, we get this thick, sticky mucus buildup, again, because of the inability to regulate salt content, we get this sort of globby, gooey mess in the lungs. Now, in a normal airway, you have a wide open space that where the airway is lined with just a thin layer of mucus, not thick at all, allows for normal airflow. With someone who has cystic fibrosis, this mucus begins to build up um, because there, there's this, the regulation of moving the, the salt in and out of the cell membrane is lost. And so you get quite a bit of blockage of the airway. And the other real concern is that it can lead to infection. So cystic fibrosis is fairly you know, rough disease, there's no cure for it as of right now, but gene therapy is a potential treatment for it where we would go in and fix the defective gene. We would fix that CFTR gene that produces this faulty protein. And now gene therapy would involve inserting a normal cell 
into the cell tissue or organ with the intention of replacing the defective gene. And if you recall from our earlier uh, portions of this unit, it, in order to move that gene into those cells, we would need to use a vector. So the picture that you see here, we have our normal gene. This would be our normal gene for that CFTR protein. And it would be added to, in this case, it's added to a, a virus, which would be the, the vector being used. The virus then would be taken into the body. Uh, generally for cystic fibrosis, a good delivery method would be to inhale it. And then it gets down into the lungs, and you can see down here where the viral particles deposit their uh, normal gene into those the cells that line the lungs and then that gene would take over and produce the, the normal protein and alleviate the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. The reason that viruses are, are great vectors for this is viruses are infective particles. They're very good at infecting and so we're going to get that virus down into the lungs causing an infection and spreading that, that normal gene. Now this is an advantage of using a virus, but it's also a disadvantage or a negative aspect of gene therapy. Gene therapy is still experimental. Uh, one of the major reasons for that is that there have been side effects involved associated with gene therapy where someone receives the therapy and as a um, consequence of being infected, purposely infected with a virus, they get even sicker. They, in some cases, their immune system begins to attack the part of the body that was treated. Uh, and there have been even extreme cases where people have actually died from complications. So although there's a lot of promise with, with gene therapy, we're not quite there yet. There are some new uh, experimental treatments using gene therapy that involve uh, a different kind of delivery system that is hoped to get around some of those complications. Now what I talked about on the previous slide with, with the cystic fibrosis um, image is a direct delivery image of the gene where we're taking our, our gene, in this case it would be our therapeutic gene for the cystic fibrosis protein, we're putting it into the vector and we're, a we're just directly injecting that vector, or getting that vector into the cells or tissues or organs to replace the defective gene. The problem there again is that the immune system oftentimes recognizes these viruses as invaders and kicks into high gear to destroy them, which at the very least is going to cause the therapy to be ineffective and at the worst could cause lots of uh, immune complications to the patient. A newer type of treatment is cell-based where instead of directly infecting the patient with the vector, the doctors will essentially create a cell culture from the, the patient's own cells and that's so that they're immune compatible and then they will infect those cells with the therapeutic gene. You can see here the therapeutic gene in the viral vector infecting the patient's own cells and then those genetically modified cells are re-implanted into the patient. That <clears throat> method or that delivery system seems to be effective in bypassing the the problems with the immune system. So the big idea here with gene therapy is that we're going to try to correct the defective genes at the genetic molecular level so that the proteins that are produced are normal and function correctly. So again, gene therapy, we're pr protecting ourselves against diseases which are caused by genes that we are born with. Now, vaccines, on the other hand, vaccines have been around for a very long time and provide us with a tremendous amount of protection. Uh, these, the protection that vaccines provide us with is protection against external threats, threats that are primarily infectious uh, particles, pathogens, things like that. A vaccine is a solution that contains an attenuated version of a pathogen. Attenuated means that it's been weakened uh, so that it is a, still able to cause infection, but it's not able to spread as a disease. And what, it, what happens is when the vaccine enters the body, the immune system begins to recognize it and produce what are called antibodies. I'll show you this picture here. You can see that happening. Vaccine is injected into the cell, and then the immune response is to produce structures called antibodies. Antibodies are essentially signals that attach to these invading particles and then those combined are attacked by white blood cells and destroyed. So an antibody is a, a way to label an infecting particle for destruction. So once those disease organisms, which are very similar to the vaccine particle, once those disease organisms enter the system, the antibodies are produced right away and the body can fight that off, the immune system can fight that off. Now, vaccines, as I mentioned, have been around for a very long time, and 
their discovery was critical in a turning point in our fight against smallpox. And you may recall that we did a little activity earlier this semester where you learned a little bit about smallpox. I'm going to show you a video clip here that shows how the vaccination against smallpox was first discovered. Our next great discovery happened in the 18th century when smallpox killed an estimated 40 million people around the world. Doctors were unable to find the cause or discover a cure. But in a small English village, talk of how some locals were immune to smallpox got the attention of a country doctor named Edward Jenner. It was said that villagers who worked in the dairy business were safe from smallpox because they'd already been infected by cowpox, a related but less severe disease that afflicted cattle. Cowpox victims suffered fever and sores on their hands, but little else. Jenner studied the phenomenon and began to wonder if the pus in the cowpox sores was somehow responsible for protecting against smallpox. On May 14, 1796, during an outbreak of smallpox, he decided to test his theory. Jenner withdrew pus from the cowpox sores on the hands of a dairy maid. Then he visited another family in the village. He inoculated a healthy eight-year-old boy with the cowpox virus, confident in the outcome. In the days that followed, the boy developed a slight fever and some cowpox blisters, then recovered. Six weeks later, Jenner returned. This time, he inoculated the boy with smallpox, then waited. The moment of success or failure was at hand. Within days, Jenner had his answer. The boy was completely healthy, resistant to smallpox. Vaccination for smallpox was revolutionary because it represented people's attempt to intervene into the disease process, to prevent it up front. This is the first time a man-made product had been used actively to prevent disease before it occurred. Fifty years after Jenner's discovery, Louis Pasteur pushed the concept of vaccination even further, developing vaccines against rabies in humans and anthrax in sheep. And in the 20th century, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin independently developed vaccines against polio. And we owe it all to Jenner's great discovery. So that's the story of how vaccination was discovered and, and began to spread unintended their right spread like an infection. Um, one of the problems with vaccines, of course, is that you're using a version of the pathogen to develop immune um, an uh, antibodies, which are part of the immune system. And of course, in some cases, what happens is the pathogen is not fully attenuated, it's not fully weakened, and it can actually cause disease. Now, that's not such a big deal if you're being vaccinated against the flu and you end up with a mild, mild case of the flu. However, if you're being vaccinated against a much more dangerous type of disease, like, for instance, smallpox, you certainly don't want to have a chance that you're going to get the disease by getting the vaccination. Genetically engineered vaccines are one way which scientists have found to, to sort of get around that problem of having the vaccination itself cause the disease. What occurs with a genetically engineered vaccine is that the the generally speaking, a surface protein gene um, from a pathogen that we want to vaccinate against is moved into a harmless vector. And because that vector is normally harmless to us, our immune system uh, is able to identify it and finds that it's not a threat, and therefore that, that, that um, the antibody can be produced against the um, surface protein, but it's not going to cause a disease in us. So this is a great example here. Um, this is the genital herpes virus, 
So scientists would isolate the gene that codes for the herpes surface proteins. These are the surface proteins that signal the immune system to respond, right? So this is cut out using a restriction enzyme, just like we learned in genetic engineering. And then that, that gene of interest, that surface protein gene, would be moved into the harmless cowpox virus genome. And what's great about this is it's going to produce the surface protein. So the immune system will recognize and produce antibodies against it, but it's not going to cause a disease. And so what ultimately happens is your body is pre-programmed to defend you against exposure to the herpes virus. So for instance, if, you're, if you've got this vaccination, uh, any exposure to the actual herpes virus will be met immediately by antibodies which can hopefully uh, destroy those viral particles before infection really sets in. So I'm going to wrap this up today with an animation that goes through viruses uh, and their use as vaccines, specifically with genetically engineered vaccines. There are a variety of ways to produce vaccines. Traditionally, vaccines have consisted of killed or inactivated pathogens. A second traditional approach is to use an attenuated strain of the pathogen. During attenuation, the pathogen loses its virulence, but retains many of its antigens and is therefore able to elicit an immune response. Subunit or acellular vaccines consist of selected components from the pathogen, such as a surface structure, an internal macromolecule, or the flagellum. Recombinant vaccines are produced by cloning the gene for a structure, such as a surface protein from a pathogen, into a host microorganism. For example, the gene for a surface protein of the hepatitis B virus has been cloned into a yeast cell. The yeast produces the virus surface protein, which can be purified from the growth medium of the yeast and used as a vaccine. So that's using the tools of biotechnology to help to protect us against disease. They could be gene therapy, hopefully in the future, and genetically engineered vaccines right now. So we'll be talking about these things in class, doing a little bit of enrichment to help you understand them a little bit more deeply. And so again, until next time, I'll see you in biology.